Uh, let's go ahead and get this city council meeting going. Please join me for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. All right, well, welcome everyone. I will start with our traditional review of tonight's agenda. Uh, I will call for any proposed changes to tonight's agenda. We will then get to public comment. Jeff, has anyone submitted online or in person? No, Mayor. All right, we have no responses to the previous uh, uh, meeting either. Uh, we'll then uh, get into the consent agenda, which has our city council meeting minutes from our August 19th meeting and approval of an IGA with DLCD for the housing and production strategy, as well as a contract approval for the water management and conservation plan update. Under proclamations, we get to celebrate the Sandy Area Chamber of Commerce 75th anniversary. Under resolutions, we have two public hearings tonight. One to adopt a methodology for the transit uh, system um, development charge methodology, as well as the rate uh, afterwards as well. Transportation. Transportation. What I say? Transit. That's weird. Yeah, yeah. transportation. Uh, under old business, uh, design for the Mindig Memorial Park improvements and restoration. Under new business, contract award for Deer Point Park Development Phase 2 as well as a declaration of the city council vacancy for seat five and an adoption of a process to fill a vacancy for the city council seat number five. We'll then round off the evening with a report from the city manager as well as committee and council reports. Jeff, will you please call the roll? Yes, Councilor Maiden. Present. Councilor Smallwood. Here. Councilor Sheldon. Here. Councilor Walker. Here. Councilor Hokinson. Here. Mayor Pulliam. Here. Thank you for that, Jeff. With that, we'll get to the consent agenda, which has the city council meeting minutes for the 19th, the IGA with ELCD, as well as a contract approval for the water management conservation plan. So there's questions or discussion. I'll entertain a motion to adopt. Let's make a motion. Who wants to do it? Make a motion to adopt the consent. Is there a second? Go ahead, Rich. I'll second. There's a motion uh, by Councillor Hokinson, a second by uh, Councillor Sheldon to adopt the consent agenda. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 <clears throat> Opposed nays. Motion carries. Moving ahead to proclamations for the Sandy Area Chamber of Commerce 75th anniversary. Whereas the Sandy Area Chamber of Commerce has served to support businesses in our community for over seven decades, and whereas the Sandy Area Chamber of Commerce enhances the quality of life in our city by fostering and strengthening relationships between local businesses, and whereas the stated purpose of the Sandy Area Chamber of Commerce is to advocate for a healthy, responsible, and diverse business environment and provide the resources, tools, and connections that help businesses succeed, and whereas the Sandy Area Chamber of Commerce provides a variety of networking and learning opportunities as well as resources for business, career education, marketing assistance, and support for area tourism. And whereas 2024 marks the 75th anniversary of the Sandy Area Chamber of Commerce, I now therefore, I, Stan Pulliam, Mayor of the City of Sandy, do hereby proclaim as follows. The City of Sandy publicly expresses its gratitude and appreciation of the Sandy Area Chamber of Commerce, for providing 75 years of dedicated service to the Sandy community, dated this third day of September 2024. Congratulations to the Sandy Area Chamber of Commerce. All right, with that, we will move ahead to our resolutions. First one being a public hearing on resolution 2024-17 concerning the transportation system development charge methodology. Uh, I will open the public hearing for 2024-17 at 7.04 p.m. Are there any abstentions from the hearing body? Are there any conflicts of interest? Tyler, can you please provide the staff report? Yes, thank you, Mayor. Um, the council will likely recall several discussions we've had uh, leading up to this date. Um, two work sessions, one in March and one in May, and a follow-up conversation at a regular meeting in May as well, um, discussing the transportation system development charges. The last update to um, the methodology was in, I'm spacing on the date now, 20. 
2016. 2016. Thank you, Kelly. That might not be exact. Um, Sorry. It's been several years since the actual uh, methodology has been revised. We've updated the transportation system plan um, recently, which included all of the aspirational listed projects for our community's transportation needs, and then held those work sessions to talk about the merits of uh, the methodology. Um, FCS group who completed the methodology for us is here this evening. If you have any remaining questions around uh, how the methodology was drafted or anything specific with that, um, ultimately at the May 20th council meeting, staff was given direction to proceed with noticing and um, uh, moving forward with the methodology as presented and also um, moving forward with an increase of the transportation system de development charge from the $4,826 that it currently is to $9,716 for single family. Uh, we have the methodology prepared this evening to, if adopted, be um, become effective immediately. And should the rate become, should the rate be adopted as well, that will become effective um, October 1st of 2024. That concludes the staff report. Thank you. Appreciate that. Uh, with that, I will now call uh, um, for public testimony. Here are some guidelines for those of you who may wish to speak. Please do try to avoid repetition. If someone else has already expressed the same thoughts, it is sufficient to say that you agree with the statements of a previous speaker, even if that's all you have to say. If you have documents, maps, or letters that you wish to have considered by the body, they must formally be placed into the record of this proceeding. To do that either before or after you speak, email those materials to recorder at ci.sandy.or.us and staff will make sure your evidence is properly processed. To offer public testimony, for those joining us in person this evening, please raise your hand to indicate you wish to speak. If you're participating online, click the raised hand button and wait to be recognized. And if you're participating via telephone, dial star nine in order to, in quote, raise your hand and wait be recognized. I will then call on each person when it's your turn to speak. Each participant will receive up to three minutes. Our student recorder, Jeff, will let you know when you have 20 seconds remaining. Our council rules, whether you like to or not, require each person to state your name and address for the record. I will now call on any testimony for the proposed resolution. Hey, Mary, not seeing any hands in the room. Checking on the And Mayor, I don't see any raised hands. Awesome. Thank you for that. Uh, <clears throat> I'll now call for the staff recap and recommendation. Uh, thank you, Mayor. Um, staff recap is that we have a updated TSP and should update our methodology for the transportation SDC to reflect that transportation system plan. Um, so staff would recommend adopting resolution 2024-17. All right. So a motion to close the public hearing. Make a motion to close the public hearing. There a second. Second. Motion by Councilor Sheldon, a second by uh, Councilor Walker to close the public hearing. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 <clears throat> Opposed nays. Motion carries. Public hearing closed at 708. All right. Discussion. Sounds like we all think it's good. Press. I just have a question. Okay. Just remind me, um, because one of the reasons why we voted for this level of methodology is because we did not have all the rates of SDCs combined. Right. When we'll be able to revisit SDCs so we could potentially increase this if we Yeah, absolutely. Um, we have FCF's group uh, currently working on the water SDC well underway there. Um, we expect to bring that back. I don't want to give you an exact date, but uh, before the end of the year. Um, what about wastewater? Wastewater is a little bit trickier because we still have to finalize that facilities plan amendment before we can move forward with the SDC methodology. Um, uh, without going into too much of a, a tangent around that facilities plan amendment. Um, I will have to do it. Yeah, well, so I, I asked the question, over the weekend um, about the possibility of updating the wastewater SDC without an adopted facilities plan amendment, given that 
we have an idea of what costs will be, but they're not finalized yet. And so is there a number we can back into to at least get that SDC updated with um, the known project costs and recognizing that there might be some flexibility that still needs to take place uh, once the facility plan amendment is adopted? Um, I have not gotten an answer back, but that was just the Sunday morning, I think, when I sent that email. So um, that will be, as soon as we have an answer to that, we'll start working on the, the wastewater um, SDC as well. So once we get that, we can revisit the totality of these decisions, and we have the opportunity to make a change if, if more to. Absolutely. All right, thank you. Yep. And the methodology for the, or I'm sorry, the resolution for the methodology, nothing will need to change with that. It would just be a simple resolution to update the rate when and if uh, the council decides to do that. Very quick, quick implementation. All right. Uh, before we make the motion, just a uh, clarification note. Uh, so I've been calling in an ordinance. It's actually a resolution. So it's resolution 2024-17, uh, not ordinance 2024-17. Also means we just need a motion, a second, and approval. So is there a motion? I move to adopt resolution 2024-17. Second. All right, motion by Councillor Sheldon, a second by Councillor Smallwood. All those in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed, nays. Motion carries. All right, thank you for that. We're going to move into our next public hearing for the rate. I open Oregon, uh, I open resolution number 2024 21 at 7 11. No slurpee though. Um, are there any abstentions from the hearing body? Are there any conflicts of interest? Kyle, you got that staff report? I do, Mayor, thank you. Um, so the council just heard a brief recap. Uh, much of this recap here will be similar to what you just heard. Um, we have a TSP that was updated recently. Now we have a uh, transportation system development charge methodology that has also been updated. There was some robust conversation in May around um, what changes should be made to the SDC rate for transportation. Uh, ultimately, at that meeting, the council felt most comfortable with this medium and high priority projects, which translated to a $9,716 um, uh, SDC. Councillor Maiden um, asked a great question earlier that I'll be sure to touch on during this uh, recap, which is um, that that number was sort of arrived upon based on not having all of the updated SDCs for water and wastewater and having a, a holistic picture of where SDCs will likely go in the future. So um, all that to say, this sort of medium and high uh, priority projects is a great start in building up our uh, street fund, again, our transportation fund for future capital projects. Um, and we can modify that rate in the future once we um, have updated the water and wastewater SDCs but for now, this was the, the rate that staff was provided direction in. Um, and so modifying the SDC from $4,826 to $9,716 is the recommend, excuse me, the recommendation this evening. <clears throat> All right, we'll move ahead to public testimony. Uh, here are those guidelines again. Please try to avoid the repetition. Someone's already said it, they can say it. If they have document, if you have documents, maps, or letters that you wish to have considered by our hearing body, you need to send those to our recorder. That's Jeff over there, recorder at ci.sandy.or.us, and staff will make sure the evidence is properly processed. To offer public testimony, uh, if you're here, just raise your hand. If you're participating online, you click that raised hand button on the Zoom. If you're telephone, you dial star nine. Um, I'll call on each person when it's your turn to speak. You get three minutes. Jeff, let you know if you have 20 seconds left, and uh, you do need to tell us your name and address. I'm serious this time. Call for the test. I'm now calling for the testimony on the proposed resolution. Hey, Mayor, not seeing any raised hands in the room. We do have one raised hand online. So I'll go ahead and uh, click the button. You should be able to unmute yourself now. As the mayor indicated, please state your name and address for the record, and you will have three minutes. Welcome. Hello, my name is Kendall Pelton and I live in the city of Sandy. I'm opposed to any further rate increases until you have all your SDCs together. We've let that go too many times. You need to submit an address for people. Kendall, excuse me. So um, we'll, we'll go ahead and ask you to unmute again, but we do need to have your name and address for the record. So for my safety, my address is already um, logged within the city and I live in the city of Sandy. So 
I'm saying I don't uh, agree with any rate increases until you have all your SDCs because as it is, we have a senior living by themselves, not watering a lawn, not doing daily things that would increase water and they're paying over $240 a month. That's ridiculous. We need to get the fees cohesive and to a point where people can actually re reside and live on them. Thank you, Kendall. And we just, let, let's talk offline. We have got to button up for, if it, we either need to change our, change the rules and the structure, or we need to develop a process for people actually like abiding by them. Either one, I don't care which one it is, but let's just get like within compliance. All right, any others? No, Mary, I don't see any other raised hands. Thank you. Uh, with that, I will call for the staff recap and recommendation. Thank you, Mayor. Um, so just recapping uh, this fee uh, increase this evening for the S transportation SDC is reflective of the conversation that was had at the end of May with the council and the direction with, that was provided at that point in time. Uh, point of clarification that this is a system development charge, not a, uh, a rate. So this is um, paid for at the time of new construction. Uh, when someone pulls a building permit, this is not a, a fee that is uh, paid for by current you know, residents or homeowners that are watering their lawn or, um, or rate payers, rate payers, payers uh, uh, on the utility side of things. Uh, apologies if that wasn't made clear um, earlier in the conversation, but this is a, a fee that's specifically associated with um, new development. Um, and with that, staff recommends adopting resolution 2024-21 updating the transportation system SDC. Thank you for that, Tyler. Is there a motion to close the public hearing? Make a motion to close the public hearing. Is there a second? I'll second it. Motion by Councillor Sheldon and a second by Councillor Hokinson to close the public hearing. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed nays. Motion carries. Mm -hmm. Closed at 717. All right. Discussion or a motion to approve resolution 2024-21. I move to adopt resolution 2024-21. Second. Motion by Councillor Walker, a second by Councillor Sheldon. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed nays. Motion carries. Awesome. Thank you everybody for that. Let's thank you. Ahead. Thank you, Kelly. Let's move ahead to old business. The design for Mining Memorial Park improvements and restoration. Hello, everybody. Okay. Hey. So while uh, they're getting set up, I'll just give you some background here. Thanks, Tana. Thanks, Zach. Thank you. Guys. Appreciate it. Thanks, y'all. So you may be feeling like a bit of deja vu because we did talk about um, Mina Clark at a work session about a month or so ago now. Mm -hmm. um, Parks Board has also had a conversation around um, the, the same presentation that you received several weeks ago, and there's an open house uh, later this week to talk about Mina Clark and the amenities there. Um, and so with that, this is a um, follow-up from that work session. I'll kick it over to Rochelle to yeah, get things excellent. going. Yeah, and I'll say just a little bit more, but good evening, Council Mayor. Um, it is great to be here tonight. This is the second time we've been in front of Council speaking about Meinig Park. And we just want to recap a little bit on what we had heard from the Parks Board, summarizing what we had heard from you all last time. Um, there's going to be areas that we're going to talk about tonight that are focus areas. And I just want to remind the council that the focus areas are not necessarily priorities that we're trying to list. However, areas that during this renovation and improvement that we're looking at focus areas. And there'll be a time, and it's not quite now at this point, where we'll bring back before you um, cost estimates. We'll talk about um, applicable funds, how we plan to fund this. So very similar how we got to where Cedar Park is today. Um, so just want to put that out there right now. So some of the focus areas that we're going to talk about tonight are No Name Creek and that restoration and what we pulled from the 2011-2017 plans. We'll talk about the pathways. There was some in-hill seating that was pulled over from the previous designs. Um, we've got Fantasy Forest, which is going to be, a, I think, a fun conversation tonight, one that I think is, um, you know, lead to some really good ideas as far as it's a very cherished community asset. And so we really encourage um, the council to, you know, um, what are your opinions on Fantasy Forest as we move forward? And we'll talk about some of the things we've heard to date regarding safety of Fantasy Forest and, and what that future looks like for that. And um, I guess at this point, just to remind everybody, we do have an open house September 5th. 
at the community center starting at six o'clock. And we've been encouraging the community to come to that and provide input. And in fact, we were just down there talking to the neighbors, hoping they would join us and let us know how they feel about this wonderful community park. So, um, and then it will be back in front of council October 9th. So I guess without further ado, I will share my screen if Jeff will let me. And then- <laughs> Oh, I'll need to promote you. There we go. Okay. Thank you, Jeff. It's temporary. Yeah, <laughs> I will. I will get my yep, my rights revoked. All right, it says I'm joining. Okay. You think we have the Zoom stuff dialed in by this point? That's all. It's ready to get on the surface. I want to send it to you. Ooh, can we see it? <laughs> Yay! All right. Okay. Well, um, now that we're we've got that, I will. Yeah, I'll hand it over to Brian. So. Yeah, as Rochelle said, we're excited to be here tonight. It's really a continuation of the conversation that we had here a month or so ago, as well as that uh, other conversation that's similar taking place with the Parks Board. And it'll be continuing on this Thursday night with the public and really engaging them with this process of the improvements to Mining Park and these focus areas and really starting with the work that's been done and piggybacking off that, basically fact-finding, does that still um, that planning work from 2011, 2017, how does that fit into 2024 and 2025 moving forward, making sure that those priorities are still appropriate. And um, so just a quick touch on the existing conditions. I think everyone is quite familiar with Mining Park right behind us here down the hill. And um, if we look at the next slide, as has been mentioned, there's these five focus areas that we've honed in on that were established in prior planning documents and that we've, um, at our last meeting together and with the Parks Board, established uh, an almost parallel group of focus areas just for ultimately for originally for feedback to make sure that we were headed in the right direction, that these were still appropriate focus areas. And one thing to remind folks that came out of that was there was the, um, previously we had put out there based on previous planning, the dog park and from multiple groups and this group included, it was really concluded that that wasn't a priority at this time. So that's no longer a focus area that we're um, highlighting at this point. And it's not something that we're gonna be sharing with the public on Thursday. But what has been added, one, one Oops, last touch sorry. on that was the uh, parking lot, just the lower parking lot right behind the building here shown as number five as another focus area of improvements, maybe a little bit more um, prescriptive in nature than some of the other improvements, but still important nonetheless. So we'll touch on that towards the end. So as we touch back oh, on- Can I have one question oh, on yeah. that previous slide? So um, is that going to, that lower parking lot gonna be the main ADA parking or or I guess, I guess it could be down below too? Uh, um, I think that there are multiple areas that there, there, there will be ADA parking. There's the potential to have it in that lower space, but it's not dependent on that. As you mentioned, in the lowest parking lot, there's accessible parking there. Then also part of the plan uh, moving forward with the update of the trails would be to have accessible parking right where the stairs are now and a ramp that would connect right from the parking lot behind us into the park. So that would be a, yet another accessible route that way. And as long as you're on that slide, uh, that private property, because in that little carve out, uh, yeah, in that area, do we know who owns that? That's where the apartments are going. Yeah. yeah. Okay, that's that's the one that's been developed in some apartments. Isn't that right, Kelly? Townhomes have twelve yeah, townhomes. It's, 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 it's apartments. That was correct. Oh, I thought it's apartments. Okay. okay, so we'll want to keep that in mind as we're thinking about this mm -hmm. and move forward. So the first focus area so, is sorry. So we're but we're not making other than access improvements. We're not um, doing any improvements to the parking lot or anything up here, though. We're not like adding spots or anything like. It's that. pretty constrained as it is. So it's really a, a resurfacing of the parking that's there and striping it to have the accessible parking. And as part of the study, have we thought about what the long term parking? like fit for this park should be like, are we meeting those demands? Are we going into the future meeting those demands? That's a great question. And that is something that we're looking at. 
just to, you know, there's so many, and not so many, there's several different access points to the park and different types of events throughout the year. And yeah, what is that parking demand in, in our we Well, and I would tell, ask council then, is this, you're looking at the facility plan mm -hmm. and how these all match together. Um, you're sitting in a really expensive parking lot. <laughs> like, you know, as you're thinking about what to do with this location, the sandy net investments and all that, that is our main park. You need additional parking. So it's something to be thinking about. So it's cool. right. Sorry. Thank you. No, it's, it's all good. So the first focus area here on this slide is No Name Creek and the improvements um, to the existing conditions there to really spruce up that ribbon flowing through the park and we, we touched on some of the some of the process last time but just to highlight what that'll look like i think this first slide is kind of a graphic of some of the the focus areas of what the improvements are the circle with the number one there in the top center shows some of the access points and these are highlighted along no name creek with those small orange and red bump outs so these are off of the existing or the, the realigned pathways are paved areas that come out close to the creek and then a series of tiered steps down to the water's edge, really picking up on some of the planning work that was done before with the layout and the location. But as we talked about uh, with, with the parks board, just really providing focused areas of access so it's not just a free for all of the whole edge of the creek is accessible, but really trying to focus our um, revegetation efforts, both three and four, but also giving people the opportunity to get down there and to touch the creek. And the, the last one I'll touch on is number two, just the stream bank restoration. There's the existing photos that we looked at a month ago. There's just quite a bit of erosion that's been happening over the years, partly due to people, <laughs> interested people just getting down to the water's edge. So really shoring up that edge. I apologize. I was here a month ago, so maybe if I'm rehashing stuff, you guys let me know. But during heavy rain in the winter, that little creek can flow. And if we put anything permanent down into that area, it's going to look like those stairs down to the beach when the king tide comes, they're going to be gone or damaged or stairs to nowhere. It, yeah. Um, can you go back to that previous slide, please? Uh, so, the, so what we sh are showing now is that all the access points will be on the well, that is the south side of the, the trail creek. side. Yeah. And it, so, you know, typically people are down there for movies in the park and the concerts and everything, and the kids are sitting on the blankets and then running, to, you know. And so I'm just wondering what the potential is of having, and it's kind of, you know, it's not really, well, I don't know, maybe it is staircase, but you know, what I guess we were envisioning was kind of just more flat rocks that kids that could be uh, anchored in uh, into the ground, but but also um provides you know access to kids getting into the creek and having a couple of access points on the big grassy because that's where they're going to go that's where they go now and so i don't know if that's it's potential to have you know at least one or maybe two on that side uh i i get that having the access from the trail is good but but it's usually they're doing something, they're kind of playing in it while the parents are just usually sitting there so those are both really good points. And I guess to the first one, that mm -hmm. what you were describing is at least what I had in mind and what I was understanding the original documents is basically stone slabs. So they're anchored into place and, and structurally sound. And to the to your second point, you're right. Uh, um it it feels like there's a lot of public access demand to the, I guess, the plan west side here. I was as we were making one of the boards for the presentation on Thursday this afternoon, I saw there's one. Uh, it shows up on this slide, actually. It's very hard to see, but there's one flat area on the that side that we're discussing that was on the original plan. So mm -hmm. at the very least, they they acknowledged that. But that's something they, for us to consider moving forward is where thinking about where the most demand is right. and, and responding accordingly. So while we're on this slide, this was just um, one of the sheets taken from that original design work. So this is showing... And we'll add some color to this when we show it to the public, but it's basically showing the channel right now, restoration efforts of vegetation on the sides of it, along with these um, stepped access points, and then just really specifically the types of plants that they called out and where those would be planted, how close they'd be planted, and 
the process for revegetating uh, the appropriate areas along the creek. Uh, you've you've told everybody at some point that it's going to forever be that yellowy orange gold color, and we can't get it out right. Like they yeah. all they all know that. Yeah. I just would hate for yeah. people to think that you restored it and it's going to be blue water, and then it's not. But we're designing the vegetation to yeah. complement those colors. Yeah, I get it. But <laughs> I'm making sure that that <laughs> message is yeah, exactly. Clear. Okay, yeah. cool. It might an interpretive side. Well, you guys not, may or may not. not but Carl for years would ask and be told. Yeah. In, yeah. Was yeah. It, Trying to get it cleaned up. I don't. They wanted it, but it's impossible. So, I think we just rename it Gold Lake or Gold Stream. Yeah, it's, it's no longer no name. It has yeah, a name. Yeah. 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 <laughs> so the next resolution. Yeah. <laughs> the next focus area we want to touch in on is Fantasy Forest. And last time we talked about the existing conditions there and how um, so much of the work, the wood there, is in a state of decline, and the Parks Department is for many years been repairing that diligently, but it's just really past the end of its life cycle. And I think before I jump into the options, that's something that's really important that we effectively communicate starting Thursday to the public so that they understand it's served its purpose and it really does for everybody's safety need to be replaced at this point. It's not just a matter of replacing a couple more four by fours one more time and it's it's okay, but it's it really is based on everybody's assessment that's been out there technical expertise says it needs to be reconstructed from the ground up. Um, so starting from that point, just just ensuring that we're communicating that effectively, I think helps. I don't think you can. Um, well, it's I a heavy it's lift. It's a really hard story. Well, I mean, you can't convince me, and I think you're going to have a hard time convincing anyone else to. You know, I just, before, when I was looking through your stuff, I went to, I just Googled Leathers Playground, uh, uh, how long does it last or something like that? And it said first right up there, 25 years. And then I'm like, Yep, it's 25 years. That's how long it's been. Yeah. So, um, 20, 29. Yeah. It's 99, yeah. 25 and, years. And it was a great conversation, too, amongst the parks board about this exact topic about whether we replace, repair. And the consensus of the park board was the fact that it's at, you know, the 29 years, it's it's beyond its useful life. It's a oh, safety it's concern. Right. concern. Yeah. So, and that's where the fun conversation comes in as far as um, the options that Brian will be offering up today, getting a sense from the council, you know, what's currently there. Are we, do we want to honor what's there, but getting the feedback and really making sure that we engage the public in this conversation. So when we do put something there, it's a signature piece. And yeah, it's not just a surprise when, mm -hmm. you know, when it shows up. Like So yeah. Rochelle, um, I know we've had some conversations about these as a parent, which has hurt me in the past, as I've mentioned, that I'm like in panic mode the entire time trying to find my kid, right? Because yes. there's a lot of hidden areas. Mm -hmm. As I'm looking at one of these, right, you mentioned to me in casual conversation that you think over the years they've tried to change some things to make that less of a problem. I'm seeing these structures are a lot less like total blocking as what we currently have. So is this kind of what you were talking about in this conversation maybe? where it's a little easier to spot the little ones running around. Yep, exactly. And, yeah. and, and Brian can chime in on that too, but that we, we actually received the same feedback from the parks board. Mm -hmm. And um, so that, that was something. And then the conversation of after hours, people having a, a nook to hide and sure. hide there. So we've been mindful of that, but I don't know if you want to add anything. To well, that. yeah, and definitely the, your, your last point is just something that's an ongoing evol evolution of a conversation where it's just, it's not something, it wasn't necessarily at all the same level of consideration when it was, when Fantasy Force was originally installed. So it's a very different thing that we're discussing and, and planning for now. So it's absolutely on our mind. Yeah. So, so one of the things, just to add a little bit for, to your question that was brought up at the Parks Board meeting, correct me if I misunderstood, but was that these are conceptual ideas and even these can be opened up mm -hmm. so that, so that you could see more if you, if you, if you wanted. So, yeah. And I think with that, that's definitely to tag onto that is we have three different options we want to put in front of the group tonight. And these, it's not a pick and choose, which is your favorite A, B, or C, but it's the idea is to get some feeling, some play feelings out there, some ideas, some styles, and not just colors, but overall approaches to playgrounds. And it, it, so it's not like these are what we're locked into, or these are the only choices on the table. It's, a, it's basically a starting point, I would say, for an overall conversation for us to continue to take what we hear tonight and we hear at the public um, open house on Thursday and what we heard from the parks board and really bring all those ideas together. So it's unless, you know, I am totally surprised and everybody just loves one of the options, which is 
typically not ever the case. We and, and we consider we're considering all of all these too. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. So without further ado, I'll walk through this one real quickly. I think of the three, this one really in style and theme sticks closest to fantasy forest as it is today. And I think where this um takes a turn is with more modern materials. These the wood, you don't necessarily see it in the the image size that we have here, but it's it's more of a recycled wood, metal posts, um, and recycled wood horizontals as well. As has been talked about, it's a bit more open and transparent. So from the outside, you can see through, there's much more clear lines of sight. You still have the multi layers of climbing up to higher levels. Um, and in terms of accessibility, this one's probably the most um, traditional in that sense. And, and dare I say, at least forward thinking, it's more the traditional uh, transfer, transfer platforms, getting from the ground level with people experiencing um, mobility, disabilities getting from like point A to point B. It's not so much a series of ramps and grade changes. It's uh, some of the platform from A to B like by various steps to get up to the top. This one has a number of different slides, um, some chain, some um, vertical climbing elements. As I mentioned, some higher forts. A lot of, I think overall types of play elements that we would all be familiar with from regional parks in the area. Yeah. And like a swing sets, yeah. uh, does that or is that included here? And I just don't see it. Or it's on the left in the upper image. It's very okay. faint, but it's behind that major yeah. slide element. Yeah, and that's the kind of thing that I think um, if there's the you know those are very typically very popular. So that's something that we can absolutely incorporate into any mm -hmm. any one of these swings or spinning elements. Um, so this second option really takes. The idea of those forts and uh, is a much more modern um, interpretation of that. It has a series of three or four vertical columns, these uh, sky forts with series of slides coming off of them. And I think that the access would be probably similar to option A in terms of um, people experiencing um, any or people with using mobility devices to get around. This one has this whole series of tactile panels on the insides. And again, maybe a series of transfer in the bottom, kind of one of the center images there, you see a, a series of transfer decks to get up to the higher levels. Has some pretty amazing net climbers to get from area to area. And then unfortunately just off screen in the bottom right images has this whole network of um, a net scramble. And then one last thing to, sorry, one, one piece to touch on that is, just looking, putting out the idea in the lower left corner of um, an all-inclusive type of spinner, where it's it's this it's a, essentially a merry-go-round that's accessible. It's flush with the ground, so you can roll right into it. So it's users of all abilities um, can be on the inside, the outside, and um, inclusive for everyone. So what all spins on that? Is the white panels go around? Yeah, so the, if you the follow the blue lines down, that all spins in the ground. So where the boy is in red in the very middle, he's standing on something that would spin. Okay. It's a safety surfacing around that's fixed. Okay. And then this last option, I almost want to say like, ignore the colors in the beginning, but- um, It's hard not to. <laughs> so I won't even bother saying it. I take it back. <laughs> Um, one thing, so the, the first do, thing that do we call this theme park? What are we doing? Well, yeah, if I'm a business owner, I'm so angry about the Sandy style stuff. And when we, when we, when <laughs> we, we do, do this, let's do something like that. Yeah, yeah. Like, I just, <laughs> uh, when, when do you know what I mean? Yeah. I'd be like, wait, I gotta do what? Okay, we'll brown. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, one thing that in, in doing, um, some image research and, and trying to come up with a, a variety of players. One one reason this caught our eye was in the upper, the, both of the upper images, you start to see that this site isn't actually flat. There's quite a bit of grade change. There's the concrete ribbon on the upper left image that wraps around the site, which basically is this built-in ramp. So you can get from the bottom all the way to the top without using any stairs, any, you know, anything that looks like a traditional ramp. It's just, and I, why that matters here is I think it really could be the type of 
play feature that we integrate into the side of our hillside slope here, where it's not like you look at it and you think, oh, okay, we've made concessions to, it's a very inclusive playground, but here's the obvious reason why it, it happens without even knowing it. So it's like true inclusion where kids don't have to take a separate route. It's the route that everyone's taking to get to the top. And inside this one, uh, the bottom left image you see, so you get to the top and you can travel through this, it's, it's the horizontal, this really bright colored tube there with the, lets the light in. And, and again, this is a place where everyone can get um, and get to that, like the coolest place on the playground. And there's the tall net climber on the right side, get from the bottom to the top. And I think one thing that starts to show up in this, not to talk too much more about it, is this has a number of different separate play pieces. You have the big structure in the middle, but then it starts to break into a number of smaller play elements, spinners, um, definitely swings outside of the image here, mounds, um, teeter-totters. So it's really incorporating all levels of play and then people that want to be in, in the mix with everybody, but then also people that want to maybe play off to it, the side in a more quiet space. I guess I don't know that it matters, but I am curious. I mean, so of these three, like, kind of different looks, do we know of any neighboring or kind of adjacent communities that currently have parks like this at play? I think the first one is the the one that's more natural and, and tucked into the woods is something that we would, I, I can't give you a specific answer of, of where, but I think that one is going to be happening um, in quite a few of our neighboring communities. Mm -hmm. The second one was actually an example from down in the Bay Area. Um, it's just a couple years old. It was more of a custom, uh, uh, not an off-the-shelf element. So I don't think that that specific type of play is necessarily here in the area. And this third one, um, I think, is kind of straddling that semi-custom, semi-off-the-shelf. So we could, I think, as we start to... The feedback that we get, I think our homework is to say, here are some similar play playgrounds in the area to, to point to with mm -hmm. these types of features that are uh, de more desirable. And I kind of, uh, Rochelle's I'm sure just rolling her eyes, but I kind of uh, took, you know, little screenshots of it and then figured out where they were, because it's kind of hard to see some of these, you know, with these pictures and stuff, how it really works and what, what happened, but like this, the first one was in uh, Florida. Florida. Uh, I had the names of them. And then the second one is in, uh, the third one's in Overland, Kansas, and the second one's in San Mateo. Oh. And uh, yeah, it's, they're really uh, kind of neat. Um, and one of the homework that we had done too is um, the, there's really good YouTube videos that show these actual playgrounds with kids interacting. We do have the links with us tonight, and I would, you know, I, would say based on time. I don't know if this group would be interested in watching them, but they're really great videos out there that It'd show. Be great to have it on the uh, yeah when you have when you have your meeting. Yeah. 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 Because yeah. that gives you a better understanding of how how it works. Mm -hmm. I have some questions or comments on that. Yeah. Um, first of all, like I said, kind of hard time convincing me where we're at. I do think we're ten years too early talking about this. I'm not. I know we're coming, but the wood and the age of the wood and things like that is affected by sun and other factors. And so when we take a flat 25 year view, my question would be in what climate and in what conditions, because the wood there is actually better than you would expect to see 25 years in Bend, for example, or somewhere else. So uh, I think we're a little early in, in headed down this path. That said, going back to your, your site map, if you would have three or four slides back. We do have opportunities here going beyond the purple as you head down to the main parking lot. That slopes down. It never grows. It's always bare. If that were to be incorporated into a future park through these grade changes and things like that, I think that's a very good opportunity. It starts to bring it down into that lower level. I like where you're going with that. Uh, but I got to tell you, I mean, I moved here because I came for a job off for it. I was driving down 26, and the first place I stopped was in Mining Park. And I got out, I smelled the air, and I saw that park and the, the, that whole thing. That's what sold me on this whole area and moving here from Texas. So to me, that's near and dear, and it's got to retain that feel because I think the whole community feels like that. I think if you put in some modern jungle gen in there, I think they'll be just outraged. I agree with that. I just, I, 
that's where I'm at. I'm just curious to hear what the community has to say about it. My suspicion is, is that the conservative side in me says that they're going to like the one that kind of looks a lot similar to what we currently have. Yeah. But maybe not. You know, I just think it's important that community gets excited about whatever's going in there and that it has a for all the reasons you just said, I don't think you're the first or last person that might have made their decision to cut more stay in this community for that part. Mm -hmm. Got to get it right. And, and we have other new parks coming up. So we have this new look and feel in, in Cedar Park now. And I don't think they all need to look the same. I think they can have their own very different characters so that as a parent, you know, tonight we'll take our kids here and another time we'll drive over there. It's not just neighborhood. I do. All that said, though, I do think the cosmetics of the park are important for nice. this park, though, because like. This is the Sandy Mountain Festival Park, and this mm -hmm. is the Winterfest Park, and this is our center park, right? Yeah. Like, so, you know, I mean, you do want people feeling like they're in Sandy and to have a certain marketing appeal and cosmetic appeal. In addition, that's all, kids need to have fun there first and foremost, right? But you, you get what I'm saying. Yeah. So. My question is really around features, because I really like parks one and two as well. Um, I was just wondering about maybe, it felt like, maybe part our option two has a different functionality for a more advanced group of child and i was wondering if there was any way space especially using what don just said about that lower platform to to use both examples um where you have that that you know similar feel to what we have today but then on the outskirts have almost more of an advanced range kind of like we're doing in cedar park where we have different elemental range for different age groups um, I, I wonder if, if you've considered that because it looked like those two maybe could be combined to make a, a more comprehensive park. Like I love slides integrated into hills, that sort of thing, you know, because you did that in the Cedar Park. Um, one thing to touch on in this option that's on the screen right now is to your question, it's the the part that focuses, the play features that focus more towards that two to five is off screen just a little bit so there is a separate play feature for um younger kids that's You're just not seen it on the picture. exactly yeah. unfortunately no but it is um it is addressed so it's not the expectation isn't that this larger feature would spread that two to twelve it's a this is that five to twelve really and that we would focus our efforts on yet a separate play piece beside that whether it's integrated or completely separate sometimes it works better to have it separate so that those kids it's they're not overlapping quite as much and maybe parents feel better about that but that's a great point lighting how are we thinking about lighting and uh, i started going there just because of the lights in that tunnel with that kid but i'm ending there with the homeless issues we have in that park right and just safety factors in the wilderness around that park like what kind of lighting do we have yeah just a factor. Yep. I think, you know, um, I haven't been to it yet since I don't have grandkids yet or anything, but um, Imagination Station kind of went through the same um, stressor of, you know, when their old one burned down, there was a, you know, they designed something more like one of these more uh, modern ones. And then some people kind of really didn't want that and they wanted a, another leathers thing. So they ended up um, doing another leather thing, and I'm not advocating we do that, but I think, but what I just kind of looked on Google for for that, I think they did make a lot of changes to to make it more modern, you know, to not have all those closed in things, but also, you know, like the thing that I would really love to see here is that kind of, you know, the uh, spider pyramid things, mm -hmm. you know, kind of the Christmas tree shaped net climber, because some of, you know, I mean, with fantasy forests, you know, there's a lot of kind of running around and there's, you know, some climbing up steps or, or whatever, but it's not as um, challenging active, you know, for the five to 12 year olds, you know, you're great at about, you know, seven, eight, but then you're kind of aging out there pretty quick. So just having something um, like a, a spider climber or whatever you call it, um, would, and they have one at the Imagination Station. I don't think it's as big as I would like but those are really go big cool. or go home capital. Yeah. But, uh, um, but, you know, being able to kind of combine some of that so that you have kind of more challenging things that you find in more, maybe more of two or three. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I'm not saying that we have to go with leathers or anything, because I think you can kind of get that look without necessarily having the same 
contractor, but yeah, yeah it's a uh, promise. I'm excited to see yeah. what the public wants to see. Okay. Okay. So the next focus area is the pathway improvements, which my only lead in for this, I will say is absolutely a work in progress. It's been great to get feedback from each group. Um, and I look forward to the feedback tonight. This is basically, as we've been saying with some of the other focus areas, starting with the work that's already been done. And I think we're at a place to get more feedback. So this, there's a series of three slides that the first one just shows the existing pathways um, that are to be removed. And it just to tie back into our presentation last time is for a variety of reasons, either they're not accessible, they're in a state of disrepair, um, or they're just not going to fit with the, the future path layout. So then this kind of shows an overlay of the purple the, where, where it's being removed. So you can see it all at once. And then the orange being the proposed pathway. And again, there's some there's some key connections here that we're not showing, but that, that will show up in the next round. And and basically, to so, so I'm not going to be able to make a full circle. Like, right there. Where your hand what was so I'm walking down the pathway right that that path is going to be removed that so the the section of purple that's there yeah that is actually um great observation and that is on our list of add backs so that what do you mean that this is not showing it but that will become orange so that will be <laughs> so, so it's coming back it's coming, coming back, back. Yep. you haven't lost it yet and we're not going to lose it. We're not going to lose it. <laughs> that, was, that was also feedback we received from the parks board too. Okay. Right. Yep. All right. Well, so part of the that's this is great. This is that vetting of what's been designed before and getting feedback from people using the park, both before and during that that interim time. And, so it's, and back to what the mayor just said about lighting. Is this at the time when you would install electrical with the new with the new path so that future events would have the power we need to support additional lighting structure. Yep, absolutely. And and um and that's on the last side of slide as far as amenities that we know are important that should be included in the renovation and improvements. Yep. I think the thing to it's kind of realize is that some of these are ADA and some are not. And so that's why, you know ADA is pushing some of this stuff. Okay. Well yeah. And so you know we've got quite a bit of elevation there. Is that is that right, Brian? Yeah. And and there are the path that we talked about that lead that will, would lead from this upper parking lot near where the mouse is at. There's a pathway that'll wind down. Yeah, basically where the right. that right to oh, there. Yeah. So it's not shown here, but we will be adding that You're in. You're gonna have to tell people where the chicken skewers are going. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> For Mountain Ridge? Festival. Yeah. <laughs> the uh, the upper purple line to be removed. How is it cost effective to make a new path below it? And the contour lines really don't look any different That's than to, than to use the the path above. The short answer is my understanding is that path, the purple path, raises in grade and then drops back down. Okay. Versus right. the one that's lower kind of skirts that yeah. similar contour and stays at a fixed elevation. But doesn't it go back up just to the left of that, where it meets the contour lines, start to get closer right. and closer. See, as it goes see up. the right hand side of that purple line. See how it just goes straight up the ball line almost. That's mm -hmm. not ADA. It's definitely something that we'll have to look yeah. into. This right here, in ground. This treatment. goes from here right up the fall line. That's not ADA right here. But it's but, ADA over on the other side because it goes straight up the same steep. In fact, those no. contour lines are closer. I mean, it has a steeper grade. How do you put them all these paths yeah, I mean, they, trees? I'm away. just I'm just yeah. curious why I'm, I'm just kind of make sure we're not. Yeah. No, that's it's a great that's question, coming. and it's um, there was definitely a rhyme and reason why it was originally designed that way, and that's part of our homework is to make sure that it's not either redundant or um, creating more inaccessible routes by fixing other ones. Mm -hmm. So, and you looked at where trees are in relation to these paths, right? Yeah, that was and part of the original a tree. focus. Yeah, yeah. Okay. yeah. The Parks Board was very adamant that the trees not be right. removed as well. I well, mean, and, and we that's already have root problems with the existing paths, so I yeah. just got to believe that yeah. wherever you're doing new stuff, we're going to be introducing root problems. And All right, that's... Well, actually, you know, the problem is, is that the paths are going right over, you know, some huge trees' roots. And so to the extent that you can meet ADA and give that tree a little bit more 
uh, you know, grace a little more space there uh, is helpful. And, yeah. and it, you know, the, the trail won't buckle either because that's the biggest problem is with all these tree roots, you know, we're going to have the same problem in 10 years if we don't lay that in there in a way that is, you know, and that's why I guess you know, one of the suggestions I would have is for the, all the ADA stuff, I can see paving that. And again, making it so that you don't cut any new trees, but mm -hmm. you also, for the trees that you do have, you don't, you know, put it right up against where the roots are going to buckle it um, and still meet ADA. And then there's a need for these kind of secondary paths to kind of shortcuts and things like that that don't need to be ADA and maybe consider going with, you know, packed gravel like Tickle Creek Trail with mm -hmm. some binder on it mm -hmm. so that you could, you know, so, so that it's something that uh, it'll be much cheaper to build and last longer and you just you don't have the problems with the trees as much because you won't get the root buckling on the trail it is really a threading the needle here and i think what everybody's touching on is absolutely right of um getting a getting a trail that's successful not removing trees but doing it in a way that yeah we're not doing this again in 10 years because we did it right over some other trees roots so do you, do you are we planning to keep the staircase down from the middle of the parking lot we have a nice little entryway there that we He's yeah, there. yeah. So that stairway remains, and then the accessible path goes to the east of it from okay, that, yeah, that right, jump off yeah. point. Okay. There's, you know, there's there's also a staircase on that end of the parking lot. And maybe, I mean, whenever I walk around there, I'm just like, you know, like I was telling her, I I went to go to the volunteer picnic the other night and I got the last parking lot space over there and I went down the little stairs and then it kind of peters out. And then I, you know, just walked along and Found myself on the wrong side of the creek and you know <laughs> all the trails and not but quite a few of the trails in there like like for example when you go to the fantasy forest from that upper parking lot you see how it just kind of stops and it doesn't get you know and just kind of runs out of trail and you're like okay why did the trail end and we're not to the playground yet yeah and so uh and there's another one where you're going over the bridge uh and, and oh just going up to those structures and yeah and the trail just kind of just, I will say yeah, while you're just, having just been to the park recently and watched a bunch of old men go from the uh, drinking the beers to having to find the restroom, <laughs> that's a long little hawk. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> there is a slide in a minute. I think yeah. it's yeah. so. I mean, yeah. but I don't see that that path is shortened at all. But what yeah. we have proposed there, I think there are opportunities to shorten that path further. Yeah, we should be considering or, or put in a second bathroom for the playground. Mm -hmm. Which we yeah, because I've I've run my little one over there, my yeah. grandkid over there, and that's a long walk too. Mm -hmm. And that was feedback. I think we can go to the next slide. I think that was feedback that we got from both council and from the parks board was to consider a restroom, which was an option in some of the prior planning work. So this slide shows the very bottom of the slide is the existing lower parking lot. And there's a structure there that's a restroom right at the base of where no name creek ends in essence this slides it kind of interesting because it touches on a number of elements tonight there is um a, a straight above the play area or sorry the restroom there there's an embankment slide that was proposed uh -huh. and then above that is where the existing uh fantasy forest is so that kind of some good ideas that have been yeah. spoken to tonight this slide touches on all those um and was feedback that we got from before about looking into what potential mm -hmm. locations for a, a, an additional restroom in the park that would complement the existing one but really service a different side of the park yeah i mean kids can ne not make it at all and that was the plan but we didn't have enough money in 2017-18 mm -hmm. um but I, when i saw the bathroom uh shelter combination over there at cedar park that you all just put in that would be a really cool thing to have here because you kind of get that combination amenity there yeah yeah, I, I will point out that if you go with this lower bathroom, you get rid of an awful lot of the only flat space that's not currently occupied by something. Uh, vision for Winterfest down the road was to have a permanent, or not permanent, but a semi-permanent top tent, you know, set up. That's where that's the only place you could go. You can go to the left of it there, right? I'm just pointing out that you, you store fifty percent of that space and target getting half to, but. The way that's been on show this. Mm -hmm. <laughs> no, no, these are actually better ways. So that's true. Would have to be a vault. <laughs> okay. 
Uh, the fourth focus area to touch on briefly is the hillside seating. And just to walk through this on the left, we diagrammed out what the original planning effort had shown. So there's a series of, I think, five arced benches there nestled in into the trees. And there were, there were some construction details that were developed at that time. And we started looking at how that would be built. And it just seemed like it was really going to have a detrimental impact to a majority of those trees right in the middle of that area, which really lends, uh, establishes the character of that forested site. So we we took um, a quick layout option on the right to see uh, what it would be to really concentrate that in the middle, removing a few trees to establish some more hillside seating, presented this slide as it is to the parks board, and it started a really good conversation with them. I think to, to take a step back and start to question the hillside seating concept in general and how we got here as a planning effort, and they, as has been said tonight, they were very adamant in their stance of do not remove trees. That's very important to the character of this space and it makes it what it is. And I guess furthermore, what is the demand for hillside seating in general? Because, you know, we just had a series of concerts and a series of movies. And um, I think it was John, John was saying it was like 400 people came to the last concert. And they all found good seating in this hillside. And, and one of the questions, one of the observations from the parks board was, so we have these six events which, which are great and well attended, but is that what should drive how we build out this whole hillside? And what's really, what's the balance was what they wanted us to find out. What's the right balance of how much seating we provide for, for those six events versus the other 359 days of the year, I guess. Mm -hmm. um, well, I think it's also, you know, I don't, you know, I'm not asking for seating as much as I'm seeing a hillside that is completely compacted and bare ground. And so when you're trying to kind of go up or down it, you can't, you know, you can't maintain, I mean, it's not helping the trees because the ground is just like concrete. And then it's hard for, you know, younger or older people to kind of walk around it. And so trying to, I think we can have, you know, protect the trees, but also kind of try to give us some, you know, first of all, decom decompact the soil mm -hmm. and make it so that we can kind of grow some, you know, native vegetation on there, even if it's just clover or, you know, oxalis or whatever, but try to kind of get some, um, some restoration on that side. I mean, it's just, it's a, yeah. It, and so, and, and, you know, that may include just a few, you know, uh, steps or something, sort of like what you did over there at Sandy Bluff Park or something, you know, just box steps or something to kind of get people down because you want to, because, and, and I mean, it's, it's kind of dis deceiving here, but, you know, you've got the staircase and you got those two shelters and then you go to go see the park, you know, so when you, you see those two shelters to the left and then you're like trying to get, figure out where's, where do I, how do I get down to where my people are? And there's no real defined area and you just kind of, you know, willy nilly it. And so having something kind of a little bit more defined, if it's in the center or wherever it is, to kind of get people down towards the creek on a path that's not too steep, or or if it is steep, then you kind of put in a few little box steps to kind of, you know, let them walk and, uh, you know, just kind of harden something yeah. in a way that protects the trees, but gives people more accessibility. And then and then once they get down those box steps, they can go to the left or the right to wherever they're staying, you know, wherever they're sitting with their friends or whatever. So that's kind of, I think, was the idea. It wasn't to necessarily build seating, like retaining walls and all that. It was kind of more natural, um, but but also improving accessibility for folks. It's it's, it's, more it's, spot to go to the bathroom is all I'm looking for. <laughs> tired of walking all the way up the hill and around the hill. It's almost more of a problem of access, you're saying, than actual seating. It's just yeah, kind of focusing just, how people get there, yeah. and so there's less. Because now they just go everywhere. Going everywhere. And so I mean, when there's when there's no defined trail, they go everywhere, yeah. and it all gets yep. denuded. Yep. And so that's that's kind of where you know that's what I would like to see. And it's hard because with Mount Festival, there's just so much stuff around, it all gets denuded. Yeah. 
for yeah. this anyways, but but we have the ability to kind of restore it and stuff every few years. And, and things grow less quickly in the shade yeah, that we have here. And it's, if it's not on a steep hillside, then it'll, you know, have a chance to kind of regenerate. And, yeah. And I haven't been to all these activities. I don't go to a lot, but the ones I've been to, and maybe it's just telling the ones that appealed to me, but most of the clientele were my age or older. Yeah. And so it was interesting watching some people walk around and, you know, you kind of grimace as they stumble a little bit. Um, it's not comfortable. No, it, no, it, it's it's awkward. I, I don't know. But I I also don't want to go solve a problem that's not a real problem mm -hmm. to solve, right? You know, mm -hmm. so. Also beautiful and stunning and yeah. all those other things. Right. You know, you could make it an amphitheater and take out all the trees, but then what do you got? Why don't, you know, at that yeah. point, just go and use the other amphitheater you know, on the other side. Yeah. Okay. So in the last focus area, we've actually really touched on this one already, and that's the the lower parking lot here. And the, there's faintly, you can see some striping that's shown there. This is not proposing any expansion of the paved area. It's just redefining uh, that parking lot there. And it has the opportunity to be used for a variety of different things. You know, it's for accessible parking, but it can also be a place for, I think, for food carts to set up shop mm -hmm. or potentially for temporary um, porta potties or that type of thing to be staged there. Um, and in tandem with that, so some bollards to separate it off from traffic as needed, and also just improving the lighting here, but then jumping into the additional focus areas, um, electrical upgrades and lighting just throughout the park and really trying to be strategic about those improvements. So when there's paving upgrades taking place, we think about the adjacent electrical upgrades and not be doing things twice in that, in that sense. Uh, Kel, do, do we, no, oh, Kelly, what, um, what that, that property that's just to the south, uh, that's private land, the apartments, the, 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 the apartments, because that what's the uh, ac access point for that to the left of this parking uh, lot? Really? In that image, or I'm looking at one of your other maps. Um, because this is if the access to yeah, those right that there, new construction right? so is going to be off of my back to that one. See how see that that where it says private property that's what's all getting developed, the and they the, I think are accessing the, the highway 211 from uh. You know, just from their property. I don't believe there's any tie through. Is there? Not through our parking lot. Okay. No, they would be accessing from 211. So while you get that up, you're talking about lighting and having just walked down there the other night. Uh, from the that yellow line extends today. The, the actual path, gravel path, comes all the way up to the uh, soldier monument that we have there in the corner, and the the road. There is no other walkway to get to that entire part of town. So if we're doing any sort of money in here, we have to make sure we're making this the actual sidewalk that's going to be there for a long time because the cost to put a real sidewalk along Meinig is probably not cost effective. So we need lighting. I mean, it's incredibly dark to walk down there now. Yeah. Yeah. The, uh, the only street light that's there is as the trees have grown underneath it. So right. there's no light coming through to that walk. And just so I don't speak out of turn, I'll, I can check with Kelly too on what that development includes as far as connection from mm -hmm. our property. We, we better have a connection yeah. because there's so, existing I, I don't know functional right away today. I don't know how you guys are defending that, but uh, it's been quite some time since I attended meetings, and I think the developers may have even changed hands on that site. But when I was offered an opportunity, there was a path that was planned from that development connecting into our path and it was going to meet accessibility requirements. Cool. I mean, there's a current paved path there now that goes past that property. Uh, uh, connects. And goes, you know, yeah, connects down to the park. Personally. Paved. I assume part of that may get changed, changed out with the sidewalk, you know, along the highway, I don't know. I can definitely follow up with but Kelly given on that. the lighting, yeah. bollards would be very appropriate going down through there because even though the park's closed mm -hmm. after certain hours, that walkway is the only way to get to that back to that part of town. That's a good point. Yeah. Cool. That's where we are. Yeah. Part of these parking lot improvements too, I'll just add this in. Um, 
you know, we host municipal court here twice a month. If we have any meetings where uh, non-city staff are coming, our lower parking lot that's directly outside of this building is full of staff. So that lower lot can become a staff parking lot once it's actually upgraded and yeah. uh, striped, well lit, some bushes removed. So you can actually staff feels safe using it and walking out there when it's dark at night um, and free up some spots yeah. here for patrons that are coming for meetings, court, paying their utility bills, et cetera. And you're thinking holistically, like budgetarily on what levers you can pull to make it happen though, right? Like, cause I mean, not all that has to come out of parks. I mean- Absolutely not. Like to improve this, maybe it's or whatever. I, yeah, I, that... I think on that, but whatever fun, like you're looking at it thinking mm -hmm. easier to access, heart restricted, all those kinds of yeah. things. And I will yeah. point out, Tyler, we just bought you a really nice parking lot. Yes. Only a block away. Sure, you absolutely. We've got- uh, sure. Uh, ample parking in that sense. This one also, uh, as it was mentioned, gets used for all of our uh, food and beverage um, carts during our events, or uh, we had the, um, uh, I forget the name of the, the setup that we had from Winterfest, mm -hmm. the Alvin Rose um, mm -hmm. items there. And so, you know, having a flat, well-lit, good electrical sources in that lot for all the other events and amenities that we provide will be um, great one. <clears throat> So you indicated this was the last like park improvement slide. Is that right? Or do yeah, you have correct. more? So then on the power, like, has there been any consideration to that? Or is there even a need for that gazebo, right? The gazebo that's rented out for community stuff. And we seem to set up different community events in there. What's the power like in there? Does that need improvements, that lighting, whatever? Mm -hmm. And then my last plug is for that, that little thing theater uh stage back there is Ooh, like yeah. just go back there and stand there and stare at it it is uh -huh. beautiful yeah. and we never use it and i i, I never invited at least in place <laughs> back there you know and i don't know if it's because um the power sucks on that stage or the lighting does or like I'd love to know why people aren't utilizing. Maybe we don't advertise it. Maybe there's a reason we don't know about why a group doesn't want to use it. But I mean, it is. I'm sorry. It's just I I, I think I pull you to the side and tell you this yourself. Sorry, every time we're down there, but it is stunning. Mm -hmm. yeah, and no one ever of, uses I, it. I think a and lack so. of a cover is a big definitely Maybe. in our weather. A yeah. cover. A lack of a cover, at least over a stage area. You know, similar to the the one we have next to the creek. Smaller, but you know. So I, I just, and I don't have the answer, but I'd love to know what is it, you know, is, is it just what the cover or power, or, you know, just, just maybe ask some questions or figure out what it is, but I just, I've, and I'd love to go to a Shakespeare site, I'd love on a nice night it, in the summer sitting would, there would be unbelievable. But so. once again, lighting, get over in that part mm -hmm. of the park, it's dark, mm -hmm. you know, so you'd have to bring lighting in there to make it safer. Uh, and probably all the way up to those various trail exits and entrances. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but it's really apparent that with, I mean, we we have a, a list as long as my arm with all the things that we want to do. This is our showcase park here. Um, and it really is going to require phasing mm -hmm. um, and prioritizing things and um, so. donations. Donations. There's also like, I, I, Rochelle, maybe you're going to cover this, but the, you know, to do the no name restoration, that's, that's a salmon, you know, that's a stream habitat restoration project. It's not salmon habitat, but it could, you know, but there's money out there for stream restoration money. We actually talked about using that, doing that project when we had to pay our, uh, you know, uh, consent decree. Uh, yes, mm -hmm. our, our uh, mm -hmm. fine or whatever. Um, restoring that and they decided to do it on Tickle Creek because it was closer but you know stuff like that there's there's money out there for that project like you said the urban renewal for the or other funds for the parking lot and so we don't have to you know have it all come out of out of parks but even within the parks I think there's going to be a need to kind of prioritize and you know perhaps I don't know if you guys already have this all lined out but the sandy net and and getting you know doing the lighting and the sandy net stuff you know when you're track when you're uh running line and all, you know, underground drilling and stuff, you know, is, is mm -hmm. something you can do kind of at the same time um, with, you know, two birds with one stone type of thing. So mm -hmm. I don't know. Um, I'm excited. It's a, uh, it's a long time in coming out uh, and 
the way and just hope we can kind of prioritize things. And, you know, it's going to be a 10 year plan probably to get it all done, but that's okay. Yeah. Cool. All right. Anything else? Well, thank you. That was yeah. fun. That was fun conversation. Good to Excited back. to hear what the community has to say about it. Mm -hmm. It's a special project, special park. So mm -hmm. thanks for your work. Yeah. All right. Um, moving ahead to another park development conversation. Mm -hmm. uh, in our new business, we have the contract award for the Deer Point Park Development Phase 2. Okay. Well, this is um, Deer Point Park 2, um, Phase 2. And as the council's aware, we've been working on phase one for Deer Point Park. And so tonight, the question before the council is whether to award phase two of the Deer Point Park development to Lango Hansen Landscape Architects. And just wanted to um, talk a little bit about phase one. And um, Lango Hansen did an exemplary job with our phase one part of um, Deer Point, which involved um, a robust public engagement. There were um, open houses. We brought it before the parks board, brought it before council, and we landed on a 30% um, or a preferred concept that resulted in a 30% construction documents. And that was the end of our phase one. And just as a reminder, some amenities that went into phase one for Deer Point, um, we did land on a full court basketball. We did hear the council and that um, exploring the idea and the cost for a covered basketball court were important. Then it ended up in the final concept. There's the meandering trail that has a combination of um, native plants off to the east side of it that um, uh, complement the trees that we're trying to keep. And then there's a play structure. And we've just recently actually sent out a survey to the neighbors of Deer Point to receive their feedback on the play structure that will um, end up in that area. Is that, did you, you, sent, you sent the questionnaire? Yep. That, and it's all done now? We are still receiving them back. Okay. Yeah. So we sent out about 200. And that. you just mailed them hard copy? We did. Okay. Yep. Yep. And did you give them kind of options like what you did with us on Mining or? Yep. Exactly. Yep. And then I asked for feedback on what they would like to see. And so we'll we'll have those results. But cool. Um, so phase, phase two is a continuation of phase one and it encompass, encompasses the completion of our construction doc documents. It'll take it through 100% construction documents. It'll go through um, the second phase includes permitting, land use, it'll be bidding support, and then um, one of the things we're looking at pretty closely are utility extension and right-of-way improvements, um, being we're right next door to a development. We're just south of 26, so um, we're taking a very close look at that and meeting and have met with development services quite frequently to get some of those questions answered, and Lango Hansen has been part of those conversations, so we've had really good direction and feedback from development services on how to best try to navigate those. And then phase two will include construction oversight and then finally completion of the park. So staff is requesting tonight that they authorize the city manager to execute an agreement to award phase two of the Deer Point Park development to Lango Hansen Landscape Architects. One for their outstanding performance that this department feels they've um, performed for previous parks. And as a continuation from phase one to phase two, it results in consistency and continuity can um, continuity between um, the design and the construction phase. And then lastly, again, they're very versed in the Sandy Municipal Code permitting and um, to wrap it up, this is um, something that can be done with the ORS and a direct appointment. It just needs to be approved by council. Cool. I think you should do this. I'll entertain a motion. The one thing I wanted to ask though is uh, these courts, uh, they always just go to basketball, you know, I've noticed, but they're great at why do, do we do anything ever to bring in netting for volleyball or then pickleball or to, like, are there things that we do to increase the activity and sports that can be done? Yeah, on these I, courts? And I can start to answer this and I'm glad you're here to help <laughs> answer this. Um, but one of the things that uh, basketball courts can serve is um, you can bring in pickleball and yeah. some nets. We did do early on in um, my employment here, we did explore the idea of other basketball courts serving as pickleball courts that didn't go anywhere, but it is an option to add multiple uses to those those sports courts. So yeah, yeah. or designated weekends or yeah. No, definitely. And I think as a part of the outreach, we put a lot of those options on the table with the public and the feedback that we got was headed in the direction of basketball, but it is part of that process of outreach. And so it's kind of course. a programming thing too, I think, right? Like you could do Thursday night pickleball on such and such basketball. Yeah, but, that would be great. That would be great. Yeah. Cool. I'm missing okay. the 30% design 
Is that posted? I don't see it on the website. Okay. Oh, we can yeah. absolutely post the 30% CDs online. Yeah. The 30% was the July drawings, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Mayor. Yep. Yeah. I'm I moved to authorize the I move to authorize the city manager to execute the agreement to award phase two of the Deer Point Project Park Development Project to Langle Hansen Landscape Architects as included in the meeting bank. For a second. Second. Motion by Councillor Mate and a second by Councillor Sheldon. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed nays. Motion carries. Thank you so much, you guys. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Happy birthday. Yes, happy, yeah. happy birthday. birthday. Absolutely. <laughs> All right, let's move ahead to the uh, declaration of the city council vacancy for seat number five. Do we do it? Yeah. Uh, okay, thank you, Mayor. Um, as the council is well aware, um, former city councilor Carl Exner uh, announced his resignation at the most recent uh, council meeting. Obviously, he served the city so ably and so well for so long. Um, the, what's in front of the council tonight is two items. First of all, the declaration uh, of the vacancy of the seat, which is required uh, by the charter before anything else can proceed. And then the next item on the agenda, of course, is the process for filling it. But in front of you right now at this moment, um, what we need is just a motion to declare the seat vacant, and then we can take further steps to fill the vacancy. I move to declare the Sandy City Council seat number five be vacant effective immediately. I second it. There's a uh, motion by Councillor Sheldon and a second by Councillor Walker uh, to declare seat five vacant. So it's, it's mm -hmm. wish it wasn't. Wish we weren't. Sad. Sucks. Um, all right. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 And opposed? Motion carries. It's especially sad under the circumstances. Yeah. Mm -hmm. All right, moving ahead to the adoption of the process to fill the vacancy of city council seat number five. Uh, thank you, Mayor. And so just to follow up on that, so now that the seat is formally vacant, uh, the city council rules uh, designate a process or, well, lay out the elements uh, of a process that the council needs to adopt uh, to fill it. As you can see in the staff report, it's basically um, we need to advertise the opportunity widely. Um, staff is proposing a timeline that would include about three weeks of advertisement, which is consistent with what we do for advisory boards and similar opportunities. Uh, we would post on the website. We would put it out in the Sandy Source newsletter. I mean, we would make sure it's widely advertised. Um, then what you can see in the proposed process is that uh, we would receive those applications. We would put them in front of the city council to consider who to bring forward for public interviews. It's important to remember that all of this is a public process. So the interviews would be during a city council work session. They're not private. They're, I mean, it's, an, uh, it's a city council position, so it needs to be public. Um, so I'm sorry, I need to click forward to, um, yeah, so the interviews are proposed to take place on the 21st of October. So the meeting before that would be when the council would be reviewing the applications to decide who to interview. Um, so review the applications on the 7th, uh, interview the applicants on the 21st. If you have a candidate that you like at that time, you can appoint someone effective immediately, or the council could decide to sleep on it, consider it the next meeting, call a special meeting. You can do whatever you want uh, in terms cool. of that. I so, but we would interview them in a work session. So that's and then call a formal council meeting and announce it then. What I would propose, we could work with the mayor, obviously, on this is um, the interviews would take place during that six o'clock hour gotcha. on the 21st. And then I assume there would be an item on the agenda later that evening to make an appointment. Thanks. I just, thanks. Just, uh, right. uh, I'm happy to answer any questions. Um, hopefully, it's pretty straightforward. All right. Seeing no questions, I'll, of course, you can always have discussion or we can entertain a motion to adopt the process. I have a question. Okay. Do you have a question? No, I was just going to make a motion. Oh, okay. Well, this <laughs> we have uh, an election coming up. We have candidates that are running for election. Um, can a candidate that's running for election apply to be put to the seat? 
I don't think you can specific. I think any individual counselor or can adopt whatever criteria for their selection of a counselor they want, but I don't know that it's within our well, we legal to purview to exclude. Yeah, exclude. There we just have to look all the requirements for this position in the Sandy, city of Sandy, which I don't think is part of the electric department, though, right? No, I point, well, out, I point out that on the ground, we have day. application evaluation yes. criteria. Yeah. Right? Yeah, I'm sorry. What was yeah, that? we have application evaluation criteria. So we could put something on there if that's an important thing to us. Because the, the trickle down, you would just be creating this domino effect potentially of, of issues. Mm -hmm. so. I, I okay. can go there. Okay. Yeah. Or, my, all right. My only thing would be if you can legally prevent somebody from applying. Well, they apply. But that wouldn't that prevent that. Them. They put that would be your evaluation ballot. criteria. Yeah, yeah, be part of your evaluation criteria. Uh, uh, your uh, but Chris, to see that, yeah, and please correct me if I'm wrong, but we had a little sidebar about um, living in the city candidate versus uh, this. It's all the same. It's yeah. I should have said that on the record. That's true. Yeah. The criteria are the same. Yeah. yeah. Sorry. All right, so not a criteria, the, yeah. the minimum qualifications. <laughs> yes, yeah, yes, yeah. 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 Okay. All right. All right. So, a motion, Lori? Uh, I'd like to make a motion to adopt. Uh, let's see. I'm sorry. I was prepared. Now I'm not. I'd like to make a motion to adopt the process for filling the vacancy of uh, position five. Or second. I'll second it. Motion from Councillor uh, Smallwood, a second by Councillor Walker, to adopt the process to fill a vacancy for City Council seat number five. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed, nays. Motion carries. All right. Thank you for that. Uh, Tyler, report from the City Manager. Yeah, thank you, Mayor. <clears throat> a couple of updates here. Um, the pedestrian that was struck uh, by a vehicle on Friday um, is in stable condition, thankfully. Not, uh, you know, it was a pretty um bad accident that you know backed up traffic for quite a while but also uh, severely injured that individual and so we're happy to hear that they're in stable condition today um mm -hmm. had a question earlier this evening about the demolition Can of you tell us i'm sorry why he was hit um chief husky can fill in the blanks here for me but my understanding was he had left the action center was crossing the intersection in a crosswalk in a crosswalk and was struck by a vehicle and was the vehicle traveling too fast that I would have to defer to license, legal, everything good. Was there a blind spot? Are you not paying attention? Well, I mean, I'm not... asking because we've been harping on the, the problem spots up and down this street now for about four years since I've been here. It, it's my understanding that a vehicle stopped for the pedestrian, and when the other vehicle approached, it didn't see the pedestrian, and and then they hit. So there's no speed involved, no impaired driving. So when one stop, one car stops, and one comes flying past right. and clips and that, and that driver was cited, and that driver immediately drove here and paid the citation. Okay, thanks. Not your issue, but I'll get to my report. Yep. Um, in that same vein, I think I mentioned this in a weekend update uh, several weeks ago, but we did engage with our traffic engineer on um, identifying the best locations for traffic feedback signs. That work is underway. Um, we were initially provided an estimate, estimate of about six weeks to get that work done. I think it's been about four weeks since we met with them last, so we should have uh, some data here in the next couple of weeks about where the best possible uh, potential sites are for traffic um, feedback signs, and then we can move forward with getting those installed. Um, they're relatively inexpensive to acquire. We just need to go through ODOT's permitting process since it is uh, in the right of way. So we'll continue to work on that and follow up with the engineer. Are we, I'm sorry, are we talking about putting those on 26? Yeah, the, the conversation um, that we've had was uh, some more visual feedback so people are aware of what they're, the speed they're traveling at. How do um, the trailers smart the dog on poles? This is uh, like what we have on 211? Are, exactly. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Thank you. That's yeah. a right. Uh, so they're the, not the trailers, solar power actually. Right. Yeah. yeah. Instead of just putting out the temporary trailer like the police department has, yeah, right. working on getting some permanent right. uh, so traffic well, feedback. Yeah, so it's, it's, but that doesn't really record anything, right? It okay. does not. No, it's just the driver feedback. So ensuring that they're aware of how fast they are traveling. Um, if the council would like to have a conversation around um, uh, enforcement of those, 
No, I, I just I just want to make sure that I, I understand 26 is is a as a thorough way. Same I also way. know that, you know, given the time of day, traffic backs up, speed isn't an issue. Sometimes when it comes to that, failure mm -hmm. to stop when another vehicle is stopped and not mm -hmm. making sure that pathway is clear in this case. So so it's kind of like we're gonna spend money on a problem. Uh, when we have other spots, with, that's why I asked if it was on 26. When we have other spots within the city that I'm 100% uh, supportive of it, I just don't know that 26, Highway 26, is that location. So um, that's that's what I said. Okay, so I've been, I've been pushing this for a long time. Parking lot today, so maybe in there. Yeah. What's that? So I've been pushing this a long time because speed is an issue, and often it's the commercial trucks yeah. and things that are should know better come and flying through there. Yeah, we, I think it contributes to the red light running. Well, I won't, I won't disagree. We have some red lights and stuff, but I also say we have done, we have put driver feedback uh, out there with a very low percentage of vehicles that are actually speeding. Uh, but that's we'll my say, point. It's working. No, I, I don't think, I think what it is, is, uh, and I'll just say from my driving, I don't see, I drive that way every day and I don't see people's behavior changing because of that sign out there. What I do see is um, big trucks that are heavy that look like they're going really fast and they aren't. And I would argue that maybe even some of that has to do with ODOT and the, and the, their, uh, the timing of their traffic lights with how long the yellow is giving the driver ample time to slow down. But I just gotta say from my own experience of, of not only living out here, but also working out here for a substantial time, I don't see speed through Sandy on Highway 26 being as relevant as it is on some of the other side streets. Mm -hmm. So would be my state. So here's my point, my counter, propose another street. So I've been pushing for this one for uh, two and a half years. It's cheap. It has demonstrated, you know, there are statistics that show that it shows, slows down drivers. And we just had another accident that might have if somebody was just a little more aware, I don't know if a flashing light would make that particular person more aware or not, but we got to change something because people are, you know, we will have more accidents. We will have more people hurt. I can get behind the red lights. I can get behind enforcement. And one of the things that I would, I've been also advocating for is that we apply, and I'm hoping that our new current administration will do this, that we apply for the grants that we haven't seemed to have been applying for through Oregon Impact uh, and get some grants. I will happily vote for and support matching the funds of those grants for overtime for specifically around traffic enforcement issues to include pedestrian operations. Um, but that seems to be something, to Don's point, I agree. With, and I'm not trying to steal anybody's report, but... We have we have not chose we have not made that a priority, and I think what we're doing is we're trying to force something. I do think that enforcement is a key avenue of that, and we're not even we haven't even explored that in the past. And I hope that this will make us move that because there's there's speed, there's pedestrian enforcement, there's seatbelt, there's uh, distracted driving. There's a lot of stuff out there that we can improve that which i think will have a better impact on mm -hmm. holistic driving as opposed to just focusing on speed those are just my thoughts and we'll wait and see what the report says from the traffic engineer i mean perhaps it will say that speed isn't an issue and those those uh driver feedback signs won't benefit or it will say that so we'll, we'll have some more information in the next couple of weeks um i'm also going to reach out to odot and just uh, learn more about the process for the flashing uh like yellow light uh, crosswalks. You know, there's only, um, I think, one truly painted designated sidewalk in that downtown area between Bluff and Tenike, and it's where this person was struck by a vehicle. So if we're only going to have one that's painted and one that's, you know, truly a, a marked crosswalk, let's make it a marked crosswalk that is the safest as possible. If you have a flashing yellow light, though, you're going to have more apt to see the drivers. And I would bring it up. My daughter, four years ago, was T-boned on beers coming across when one car stopped and the other car did not. And it was, they weren't speeding. Um, she didn't look far enough past the next car and got T-boned. And I, I was upset about that same thing, but I can only imagine the pedestrian coming 
They also have an accountability to their awareness of the cars on that road. A, a flashing yellow light had been going, I bet that driver would have been more apt to see yeah. it. Um, and may or may not have slowed down, but you're just projecting. Yeah, I mean, I walk through downtown almost daily and I don't almost get struck because I know to only walk halfway in the intersection and then you know, make sure that next car is stopping. And that's what I was, you do have to make sure as a pedestrian yeah. that vehicles have stopped. Yes. So, but I will say that I think oftentimes drivers don't know to stop because they assume that car is slowing because they're turning or, you know, they don't know, they can't see the pedestrian on the next side. So if there's a way to make that more visual and, and bring more attention to it, I think that could definitely help um, prevent another accident in the future. So we'll continue to look in that. I'll look into that. Um, I received a question earlier in the uh, evening about the demolition of uh, what's been called the old bunkhouse on Pioneer by um, uh, the parking lot and the, the church down there. Demolition hasn't taken place yet. We have the contract with the homeowner um, ready to execute and move forward. They are just waiting for the utilities to be capped from an outside utility company, not the city of Sandy. Um, and so as soon as that's done, the demolition can take place, but that will happen in the near future. Um, I you said bunker building. No, bunkhouse. Bunkhouse, bunk house. Bunk house. not like, bunker what? building. If I said bunker building, I apologize. Bunkhouse. Did you miss that reading? <laughs> Um, like, no, sorry, not trying to, to jump ahead here. Um, uh, a reminder that um, we have the legislative priority survey that's been sent out to you guys. Uh, the due date for that is September 6th, so we can incorporate all of your feedback and get it on uh, the following council agenda to submit that feedback to LOC. Um, got a meeting with loved one this Thursday to see firsthand the laundry event that they're doing at the Seekers um, laundromat. Uh, I had a great meeting with Brandy from Love One last week, was able to kind of, um, you know, start the, the building of that relationship there, um, acknowledge on both of our side that there hadn't been good communication. And so we've kind of remedied that, um, got some good plans going forward as far as uh, touch points and, and continuing that conversation. Um, so I'll go to the event this Thursday with Brandy, check things out, see how that is run, what services are all being provided, and then be able to report back to the council with um, how that goes. Um, so I'm just checking, checking my notes here really quick. Um, we have, uh, I should have mentioned this, the urban renewal meeting, but there's not a uh, report section for me to provide. Uh, we have turned off uh, the online applications for the tenant improvement grants and the facade improvement grants for, uh, for the time being. So we can circle back and have a more robust conversation around the objectives of those programs and the, the future of those programs. So the two that went before uh, the board this evening are the last two that we had in the hopper. There aren't anything else that's currently outstanding. Um, so we won't have any other grants um, coming before you unless someone reaches out to us specifically and says, hey, I've got this project I'm working on. Is there an opportunity for grant, for, uh, grant funding? And we would navigate that uh, similar to how we did with this demolition project that came before the board uh, several weeks back. Mayor, do we anticipate doing that before the election or would that be a new year kind of thing? And mayor candidates, <laughs> do we have a preference uh, on the timing of that? For what's um, for the goal setting for, and for urban I, I think we should urban. probably talk for the election. So probably a January, February. Yeah. 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 So we have, um, I've entered into, entered into an agreement with Elaine Howard, who I believe some of you have met previously. She's spoken um, or presented to the council before. Some of you have not met her. She's sort of the urban renewal guru for the state of Oregon. Um, she does contract work for nearly every city that has an urban renewal agency. Um, so we have a, we had a contract with her several years ago. Uh, her and I have been in contact over the last month or so um and looking at putting together a meeting to talk about prioritization and projects and then using that meeting to really craft the beginning stages of like a five-year strategic plan so that we can use that information and build it into the budget process have some good direction on what our initiatives are our priorities are of course we can further discuss timeline and things like that once we have that meeting but that was sort of how the conversation with elaine got kicked off that we've have an urban renewal you know, agency. We've done some really exciting things, but it's time to um, have to check in, figure out where we're going, what needs to be done, and, and get the whole board um, 
so in a meeting we talk about so it. i think it's prudent and good to close those off but i would say though that that doesn't mean that those opportunities don't still exist absolutely right? and so like if something an opportunity that I, we don't foresee or see right now um, presents itself whether it's a new owner of a building that now wants to do something or whatever um, we should remember those programs and the things we can do with urban renewal and try to make things go online. Absolutely. It's just not a free uh, available form for someone to, you know, fill out and click submit. And that's how some of these things have happened in the past where they submit their, you know, uh, interest in the grant. And then the economic development manager at the time had started to work with those business owners. And then that gets us to where we were at this evening with, um, uh, with those grant projects that you saw. Um, <clears throat> And last but certainly not least, uh, I shared this on Friday with you in the weekend update, but um, extended a job offer to a candidate for finance director. We've worked through all of the uh, hiring process there and background checks and all that stuff. Uh, and so Tyler Wallace will start at the end of October. Um, make it easy for you. You don't have to remember any name. You can just keep saying Tyler when you think of <laughs> finances. Uh, he comes from the city of Portland, um, their Department of Revenue. Um, so really excited to have his background and expertise joining us here in Sandy, um, and also selfishly very excited to no longer be doing two jobs. Thanks, Mayor. Thank you. Uh, Tom? Well, I've heard most of my concern about the, the safety issues. I do think, um, I know, Rich, I, I hear what you're saying about maybe it's not the best deterrent, or maybe it's maybe not even effective, but personally, when I drive into a town, even if I'm familiar with it, like going down Kane Street, 257th there in, in Gresham, that light hits me, I check my speedometer. Now, maybe I'm one in a hundred people that do that, but I think there's more. I think people do check and they slow down. And one of the, the biggest areas that I see uh, lack of compliance for speed is toll gate. The speed limit changes well before you go to the two one ways. And, uh, there's very low compliance coming off, off there from that transition. So I think making people aware before they get into the, the area is, is important. So when you're looking for locations, I think if you're putting a flashing light halfway through town, I think we missed the point. It's They need to be aware coming into town, this, this is the speed limit. The second point I brought up many times is every crosswalk, every, the state law says you know that you have the right, as soon as you enter the the traffic, you know, that cars are supposed to stop, which the other unwritten part of it is you have the right to get hit by doing so. But I don't know why we don't have more paved, more painted crosswalks. I don't understand why we have beautiful ADA compliant on and offs into the sidewalks from the roads without any painted stripes. To me, that's that's just doesn't make sense at all. So um, why would we? want somebody in a wheelchair going that way when we don't want us our kids to walk that way. So I look forward to that explanation. Uh, lastly, uh, maybe Rochelle's gone, but we need to get that Winterfest committee, volunteer committee going. We have not met. Yes. Um, it's like September. Yeah, so I know that they put a call for volunteers out. That doesn't include the volunteers we already had, but they put a call for volunteers out. Um, my understanding is that no volunteers um, identified themselves as interested to help when that call for volunteers went out. So they will move forward with meeting I with the volunteers. Not that have. see such an inquiry. Now I'm not on Facebook every day, but I don't know where the call went. Yeah, Jeff, can you? I saw it on Facebook for sure. Okay. Yep, that's where anyway. I saw it. I don't recall if it was in the newsletter or not. Uh, and. Um, it doesn't matter. Uh, I just yeah. I don't know that it went that far. I didn't see it. Well, we can certainly put another call for volunteers out. Because Santa, oh, Santa didn't see it. No, I mean, <laughs> are you in for this oh, year? Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm trying my hardest. Okay, all right. <laughs> That's it for me. Yeah, I need a grand. Thank you. Just a part. Thanks, Scott. Hi, Kathleen. Hi, yeah, the library board uh, folks are meeting tomorrow and they've got a lot of reports about uh, just progress they've made on, uh, they're called strategic plan reports um, for all their initiatives, create young readers, stimulate imagination, 
information fluency, civics, satisfy curiosity, learn to read and write, and computer literacy are their different uh, uh, goals there. Um, so I'll find out more about that. The homeless camp uh, situation, I've been uh, working with Scott Pen Pen um, Tri Scott Trippanera, and uh, he is uh, uh, the guy that started that Sandy Trash Force and has been very helpful. Um, we've gone out a couple times there um, recently on Industrial Way to kind of help to, to clean up some of the messes, and I really appreciated the response that we got from uh, uh, Sergeant Craven and Officer uh, it was, uh, Armando. Almost. Almost, yeah. Brain, yep, there. Um, they were very helpful. Um, kind of what's happening is that um, we've got folks, you know, that are directed out there and then they head in off the sidewalk and off the road into the private property um, and take a lot of stuff that gets dumped in there. Um, so one of the things that um, we might suggest, again, it's kind of up to you guys to see how you want to deal with it, but um, normally when somebody has private property out somewhere and there's a trespassing issue or something, it's the landowner's responsibility to post those no trespassing signs. However, in this case where we're directing people to you know, stay down there. I feel like we have a little bit more of a higher threshold um, to take responsibility and possibly put up some no trespassing signs along um, both sides of the road there. Um, another option that we thought might be helpful would be to have, I, I think we do have a handout, but um, having a handout that basically talks about the regulations that are in place and the need to do, you know, to take care of your trash and the fact that that will be enforced. Because again, what we're seeing is folks are, you know, staying out there for weeks and the it's just piling up and a huge amount. Um, and or they're littering just right, you know, it's so obvious, you know, it's all over the road and the sidewalk and everything else. So it's obviously um they're violating our our uh, regulations. And so trying to get a handle on enforcing that so that we all don't have as big of a job to do. Um and then I would like to see us get a formalized volunteer agreement with the Sandy Trash Force, just so they understand what the roles and responsibilities are of all of you and what you want them to do and, you know, the sideboards on that and, you know, where do we take the trash and how does that get, you know, and all that. So just having a little bit more formalization to that so that they can all be part of the partnership. It'd be really good. Yeah, I talked to Scott on Saturday okay. about some of those things. Okay. And so we'll, we'll Great. work on that. The rock trucks uh, from the city of Portland, uh, Filtration plant are going by uh, gangbusters. Um, the other, the, the agreement that they have is that Oregon Trail Academy, Kelso School um, have limits. They can't go, uh, they cannot um, use the, um, go by those areas during pickup and drop off during school days. Um, somehow Cedar Ridge Middle School was taken off, was not on that list, so we need to get it back put on the list so that there is some, uh, uh, you know, cause otherwise it's, you know, I could hear them going by at eight o'clock this morning and just, I just sat there drinking my coffee, wondering how bad it was up at the middle school. Um, so yeah, we need to add the Cedar Ridge to the exception list. Um, finally, the water status, um, The uh, we did have a meeting and I don't know if we've updated it, but I thought just kind of, it's always good to hear this more than once. The 90% design on the water pipeline is um, being worked on. The pump station for the Bull Run is, uh, for ours, is uh, the design package is 60%. Um, the disinfectant uh, package is underway at 30%. And they're uh, working with the Portland Water Bureau on ongoing project details. Um, the land use discussions are also ongoing. They're gonna need a land use amendment in both Clackamas and Multnomah counties for us, because I guess some of that stuff is in Edo County. Um, they think the application for the pipeline will be late fall and early winter, and the pump station will be December, January timeframe. The uh, uh, current plan for building the pipeline, bidding the pipeline is late 2024, early 25, uh, with construction complete in summer of 2025. Um, they do, and the the excuse me the pump station and the disinfection stuff are are um, later on into 2025 and um, complete in quarter three of 2027. 
They are kind of concerned about, you know, that all this stuff will not be done by the compliance date of September 2027. Um, we don't know, you know, I mean, there's just no guarantees with all the things uh, up in the air on, on some of the processes. So as such, they're planning to have the Alder Creek water treatment plant at full capacity of two plus million gallons per day in 2026 so that we can meet Sandy's daily demand with no curtailment um, until June or July of 2028. So we're going to be covered there. So that's it. Thanks. Cool. And right. I do I do want to say, I thought it might be nice that we could get um, Carl uh, some sort of a yeah. recognition thing. Absolutely. Yeah, um, yeah. Jeff and I have talked about that. We'll, um, I should have mentioned that in my report, but we're working on Great. getting uh, something put in place for Councilor Exxon. And thanks for the Cedar uh, Park uh, tour. That was fabulous. Absolutely. Rich. Yeah, I want to start by saying I owe Don an apology. When he was talking 26, I was picturing the the downtown corridor. I do agree with that, that as it drops over by the toll gate, I can get behind that one. Uh, I, I want to throw that out there right now. I owe you an apology for that spot. I agree. But I do think as we get down into that corridor, red lights and all of that, I really want to stress that I think we need to apply this off to uh, for some grants uh, from an you know, Oregon impact is who runs them. I know Chief Husky is very well versed in that sort of plan. Um, with that being said, uh, the parking lot, um, I'm just wondering if we're going to, I know we had talked about the one-way bot, mm -hmm. about monetizing it, about making it so it's not just a, uh, extra business parking spots. Uh, I'm just wanting I want to check in and see where we're going to be at with that sometime. Yeah, I haven't had a chance to, um, dive into the parking kitty or some sort of similar you know uh app like that um we do have the public parking you know sign up now when it is noticed um in there the, are some with cooler names they're parking kitty that's the one that comes to mind because i use that for blazer games so <laughs> but yes we can uh, um as an example right yes. um uh we have changed the language in um our our transit um handouts to know, signify that as public parking or park and ride. Um, but there's still work that needs to be done to, to figure out how to monetize that for longer duration parking. Yeah, it's not even so much the, the money, I think, is I, I do not want to get away from that. But I also have concerns, especially as we develop a multifamily housing over there and the and the challenges that typically come with parking, that that becomes like a, a fallover parking spot sure. and that I don't want it to be. Mm -hmm. So that's yeah. my concern there. Yeah, there's currently signage for no camping or overnight parking, overnight parking. in there. Um, so we're trying to prevent that from taking place. I don't want it to become a you know place where things just get dumped or left behind or chronic nuisances uh, occur. We're not having any of those issues right now. Sure. I did put it on Google Maps, parking, public parking. Thank you. I do want to use this opportunity to reply to the uh, person who spoke today about SDCs. I would like to also just note SDCs are typically what allow us to keep fees low mm -hmm. because that's our chance to get some of our, our money back that we would be paying for that infrastructure. Thus, we don't have to bill our residents, which has always been my plight to keep SDCs up so that we don't have to pass those costs on to residents. So. I just wanted to add that. And then I also wanted to say thank you to you and Rochelle and to John as well. Um, and then the two gentlemen from the for the tour at Cedar Park. Um was exciting. Um, like I said, I'm gonna up the AFLAC for my own kid. Um, because I'm sure I'll I'll be getting a chance to use it after seeing some of that. But it is super cool and I'm excited to see that. So I think there's a lot of future potential. So thank you for that opportunity. That's all I got. Great. Great. Well, I gave you a parks update, but you guys just got the whole oh. parks thing that, so I sat through that twice. So, um, good. It's, well still, versed. it's still good, but it's, <laughs> yeah. Um, but I did have a question on the capacity or ability that we might have to, um, some of you perhaps in the neighborhoods that you live in are getting hit by solicitors. What I think is very late at night. I've had people knocking on my door at 845, almost nine o'clock about solar panels. Um, I've had a few people reach out to me that there are no soliciting signs are being ignored, no trespassing signs are being ignored. Um, I know in the last two weeks, I've had four different companies selling solar panels come to my door. So I don't know if we can look at something in our code that maybe 
I recognize, you know, I'm all in favor of people trying to make a living. I, I understand that there's probably a lot of people who, you know, want to buy solar panels, um, um, but maybe a time when it's, when it's like too late to, to, to pester people in the evenings. Yeah. We or have something that we can do that helps, you know, alleviate that in some capacity. Yeah. Councilor Walker asked um, a question about what's in our code, what's allowable. Um, uh, I guess over the weekend, I saw it uh, mm -hmm. earlier today. Um, we don't really have anything in place currently, but we can definitely look into see what other cities are doing as far as soliciting hours, time of day, business license types, anything like that. So mm -hmm. we can yeah. uh, do some homework to figure out what, what options we have. Just so people don't feel like they're being harassed in their homes. For sure. So that's all. Thank you. Thank you, Chris. I'll be quick. Um, we did not have an economic development meeting there was a planning commission meeting, although um, my father passed away in Tennessee uh, about 15 days that. ago, so I, I had to leave town for quite a while, so I did not attend that meeting, and I haven't had a chance to review the notes on it yet, but I will do that tomorrow, and then bring it up in a planning commission for our next council meeting. So, yeah. Other than that, everything else I had to say is already been said, so thank you. Thank you, Chris. Sorry to hear about your dad. Um, uh, not much to report on uh, from me. Just I've talked to Tyler about trying to get a work session with uh, Chief Husky on our time, place, and manner. A lot of the issues that you were just talking about, Kathleen. Uh, just all get on the same page, right? New leadership coming into our police department. We have a vision as to uh, how we want things kind of handled and done. We've had Supreme Court decision that was made. Obviously, there's state law, but there's all those things. It's just all get in a room and talk about. It. So. Uh, that's it. With that, everybody enjoy your Oh, back to school is great. Drop kids off this morning. I was like early, so I didn't see many traffic issues from my end. I don't know if anybody else oh, heard any, but it, it looked pretty smooth. I know at the high so. school today, uh, there were two officers that were standing at the entrance down there. So, um, yeah. So yeah, I think the parking or the, the arrangement that we worked out alleviated some problems, not all the problems on bill. Definitely work in progress. Oh, um, Oh, and I don't know if it's public works or what. And it was mentioned on social, and I, I actually totally did it the wrong way coming here this evening. So there is some manhole work or something done on DeBarco. Mm -hmm. There's a bunch of stuff coned off, especially when you're coming out of my neighborhood, which I guess, you know, since we don't want to share our address, it's 18751 Pacific Avenue, Sandy, Oregon, 95. <laughs> I'm a lot more on the spotlight than a lot of people in this community and criticized. Um, but yeah, so it's. Just yeah. trying to fix it because it's not well marked. You go around the, uh, it's hard to tell if you go to the left of the cones or the right of the cones. Almost hit a car straight onto it. He waved, we waved, like he could tell. I was confused. But this is on DeBarco. Yeah, it's okay. confusing. So it's right outside of Timberline Trail. So right. I'll take a look. With the shadow from the trees, it was really bad. Too. Yeah, yeah, it's bad. So, all right. And then we slow down the traffic maneuver right now, right? Appreciate everybody. See you tonight.